All right, we're reading Crime and Punishment again. I had stopped at page 150 last time. Page 150, where Raskolnikov had just uh, woken up and his friend uh, Razumihin was like tormenting him. And... So let's continue. Zosimov, <clears throat> Zosimov was a tall, fat man with a puffy, colorless, clean-shaven face and straight flaxen hair. He wore spectacles and a big gold ring on his fat finger. He was 27. He had on a light gray fashionable loose coat, light summer trousers and everything about him loose, fashionable and spick and span. His linen was irreproachable, his watch chain was massive. In manner, he was slow and as it were nonchalant and at the same time studiously free and easy. He made efforts to conceal his self-importance but was apparent at every instant. All his acquaintances found him tedious, but said he was clever at his work. I've been to you twice a day, brother. You see, he's come to himself, said, cried Razumahin. I see, I see. And how do we feel now, eh? said Zosimov to Raskolnikov, watching him carefully, and sitting down at the foot of the sofa, he settled himself as comfortably as he could. He's still depressed, Razumahin went on. We've just changed his linen, and he almost cried. That's very natural. You might have put it off uh, if he did not wish it. His pulse is first rate. Is your head still aching, hey? I am well. I am perfectly well, Raskolnikov declared positively and irritably. He raised himself on the sofa and looked at them with glittering eyes, but sank back onto the pillow at once, with, uh, at once and turned to the wall. Zosmo watched him intently. Very good. Going on all right, he said lazily. Has he eaten anything? They told him and asked what he might have. He may have anything. Soup, tea, mushrooms and cucumbers, of course. You, may, you must not give him. He'd better not have meat either. Uh, but no need to tell you that. Razumahin and he looked at each other. No more mason or anything. I'll look at him again tomorrow. Perhaps today even, but uh, never mind. Tomorrow evening I shall take him for a walk, said Razumahin. We're going to the Yusupov garden and then to the Palais de Crystal. I would not disturb him tomorrow at all, but I don't know. A little maybe, but we'll see. Ach, what a nuisance. I've got a housewarming party tonight. It's only a step from here. Couldn't he come? He could lie on the sofa. You're coming? Razumihan said to Zasma. Don't forget you promised. All right, only rather later. What are you going to do? Oh, nothing. Tea, vodka, herrings. There will be a pie. Just our friends. And who? All neighbors here, almost all new friends except my old uncle, and he's new too. He only arrived in Petersburg yesterday to see to some of his some business of his. He be will we meet once in five years. What is he? He's been stagnating all his life as a district uh, postmaster. Gets a little pension. He's sixty-five. Not worth talking about, but I'm fond of him. Porfiry Petrovich, the head of the investigation department here, but uh, you know him. Is he a relation of yours too? A very distant one. But why are you scowling? Because you quarreled once, won't you come then? I don't care how damn for him. So much for the better. Well, there will be some students, a teacher, a government clerk, a musician, an officer, and Zamatov. Do tell me, please, what you or he, Zasmav nodded at Raskolnikov, can have in common with this Zamatov? Zamatov? Oh, you particular gentlemen, principles. You are worked by principles as it as were by springs. You won't venture to turn around on your own account. If a man is a nice fellow, that's the only principle I go upon. Zamatov is a delightful person, though he does take bribes. Well, he does, and what of it? I don't care if he does take bribes, Razumahin cried with unnatural irritability. I don't praise him for taking bribes. I only say he's a nice man in his own way. But if one looks at men in all ways, are there many good ones left? Why, I'm sure I, would, I shouldn't be worth a big deal in myself. Perhaps with you thrown in. That's too little. I'd give two for you. And I wouldn't give more than one for you. No more of your jokes. Zamatai was no more than a boy. I can pull his hair and one must draw him, not repel him. You'll never improve a man by repelling him, especially a boy. One has to be twice as careful with a boy. Oh, you progressive dollars. You don't understand. You harm yourselves running after running another man down. But if you want to know, we really have something in common. I should like to know what. Why, it's all about a house painter. We're getting him out of a mess. Uh, though indeed there's nothing to fear now, the matter is absolutely self-evident. We only put on steam. A painter? Why, haven't I told you about? I only told you the beginning, then, about the murder of the old pawnbroker woman. Well, the painter is mixed up in it. Oh, I heard about that murder before Anne was rather interested in it, partly for one reason. I read about it in the papers too. 
Lizaveta was murdered too, Nastasia blurted out, suddenly addressing Raskolnikov. She remained in the room all the time, standing by the door listening. Lizaveta murmured Raskolnikov, hardly audibly. Lizaveta, who sold old clothes, didn't you know her? She uh, used to come here. She mended a shirt for you too. Raskolnikov turned to the wall where in the dirty yellow paper he picked out one clumsy white flower with brown lines on it and began examining how many petals there were in it, how many scallops in the petals and how many lines on them. He felt his arms and legs as lifeless as though they had been cut off. He did not at him to move but stared obstinately at the flower. But what about the painter? Zasmov interrupted Nastasia's chatter with marked displeasure. She sighed and was silent. Why? He was accused of the murder, Razumihin went on hotly. Was there evidence against him then? Evidence indeed. Evidence that uh, was no evidence and that's what he ha- we have to prove. It was just as they pitched on those fellows, Kocha and Petr- uh, Pestriakov Petra- at first. Phew, how stupidly it's all done. It makes one sick, though it's not one's business. Petriaska may, co- may be coming tonight. Uh, by the way, Raja, you've heard about the business already. It's happened, it happened before you were ill, the day you fainted at the police office while they were talking about it. Zastimov looked curiously at Raskolnikov. He did not stir. But I say, Razumahan, I wonder at you. What a busy boy you are. Busy body you are, Zastimov observed. Maybe I am, but we will get him off anyway, shouted Razumahan, bringing his fist down on the table. What's the most offensive uh, is not their lying. One can always forgive lying. Lying is a delightful thing, for it leads to truth. What's offensive is that they lie and worship their own lying. I respect Porfiry, but uh, what threw them out at first? The door was locked, and when they came back with the porter, it was open. So it followed that Coach and Petraska were the murderers. That was the logic. But don't excite yourself. They simply detained them. They could not help that. And by the way, I've met that man, Koch. He used to buy un- unredeemed pledges from the old woman, eh? Yes, he's a swindler. He buys up bad debts, too. He makes a profession out of a profession of it. But enough of him. Do you know what makes me angry? It's their sickening, rotten, petrified routine. And this case might be the means of introducing a new method. One can show from the psychological data alone how to get on the track of the real man. We have facts, they say. But facts are not everything. At least half the business lies in how you interpret them. Can you interpret them, then? Anyway, one can't hold one's tongue when one has a feeling, a tangible feeling, that one might be a help if only. Uh, do you know the details of the case? I'm waiting to hear about the painter. Oh yes, well, here's the story. Early on the third day after the murder, when they were still dandling uh, Koch and Pestriakov, Pestriakov, though they accounted for every step they took and uh, it was plain, plain as a pike staff, an unexpected uh, fact turned up. A peasant called Dushkin, who keeps a dram shop face in the house, brought to the police office a jeweler's case containing some gold earrings uh, and told a long rigmarole. The day before yesterday, just after 8 o'clock, marked the day and the hour. A journeyman house painter, Nikolai, who had been in to see me already that day, brought me this box of gold earrings and stones and asked me to give him two rubles for them. When I asked him where he got them, he said that he picked them up in the street. I did not ask him anything more. I am telling you a Dushkin story. I gave him a note and uh, a ruble, that is, for I thought if he did not pawn with pawn it with me, he would pawn with, uh, he would with another. It would all come to the same thing. He'd spend it on drink, so that so the thing uh, better be with me. Had better be with me. The further you hide it, the quicker you will find it. And if anything turns up, if I hear any rumors, I'll take to the police. Of course, that's all tar- taradiddle. He lies like a horse, for I know this Dushkin. He's a pawnbroker and a receiver of stolen goods, and he did not. Cheat Nikolai out of a 30 ruble trinket in order to give it to the police. He was simply afraid. But no matter, to return to Dushkin's story, I've known this peasant, Nikolai Dementiev, uh, from a child. He comes from the same province and district of Zaraysk. We are both uh, Ryazan men. And though Nikolai is not a drunkard, he drinks, and I knew he had a job in that house painting work with Dimitri, who comes from the same village too. As soon as he got the ruble, he changed it. Uh, had a couple of glasses, took his change, and went out. But I did not see Dimitri with, them, with him then. And the next day I heard that someone had murdered Al- uh, Alyamna Ivanova and her sister Liz- uh, Elizabeth Ivanova with an axe. I knew them and I felt suspicious about the earrings at once, for I knew the murdered woman lent money on pledges. I went to the house and began to make careful inquiries without saying a word to anyone. First of all, I asked, is Nikolai here? Dimitri told me that Nikolai had gone off, off on the spree. He had come home at daybreak, uh, drunk, stayed in the house about 10 minutes and went out again. Dimitri didn't see him again and is finishing the job alone. And the job is on the same, same staircase as the murderer on the second floor. When I heard um, all that, I did not say... Uh, when I heard all that, I did not say a word to anyone. That's Dushkin's tale. But I found out 
uh, what I could about the murder, I went home feeling suspicious as ever. And at 8 o'clock this morning, that was the third day, you understand, I saw Nikolai coming in, not sober, though not to say very drunk. He could understand what was said to him. He sat down on the bench and did not speak. There was only one stranger in the bar and a man I knew already... And a man I knew asleep on a bench... Oh, what? Yeah, there was only one stranger in, in the bar and a man I knew asleep on a bench and our two boys. Have you seen Dimitri? said I. No, I haven't, said he. And you've not been here either? Not since the day before yesterday, said he. And where did you sleep last night? In Pesky with the Kolomensky man. And where did you get those earrings? I asked. I found them in the street. And the way he said it was a bit queer. He did not look at me. Did you hear what happened the very evening, that very evening at that very hour or on that same staircase? Said I. No, said he. I had not heard. And all the while he was listening, his eyes were staring out of his uh, head and he turned as white as chalk. I told him, all, uh, told him all about it and he took his hat and began getting up. I wanted to keep him. Wait a bit, Nikolai, said I. Want you to have a drink? And I signed to the boy to hold the door, and he came out from behind the bar, but he darted out and down the street to the turning at a run. I have not seen him since. Then my doubts were at an end. It was his doing as clear as it could be. I should think so, said Zosima. Wait, here the end. Of course, uh, they sought high and low for Nikolai. They detained Dushkin and searched his house. Dimitri too was arrested. The Kolomansky men were also thrown inside out. And the day before yesterday, they arrested Nikolai in a tavern at the end of the town. He had gone there, taken the silver cross off his neck and asked uh, for a dram for it. They gave it to him. A few minutes afterwards, the woman went to the cow shed and threw a crack in the wall. She saw on the stable adjoining he had made a no noose of his sash from the beam, stood in a block of wood and was trying to put his neck on the noose. The woman squeezed her heart as people ran in. So that's what you're up to. Take me, he says, to such and such police officer to confess everything. Well, they took him to that police station that is here with a suitable escort. So they asked him this and that, how old he is, 22 and so on. I had the question, when you were working with Dimitri, didn't you see anyone on the staircase at such and such a time? Answer, to be sure, folks, have, folks may have gone up and down, but I did not notice them. And did you hear anything, any noise and so on? We heard nothing special. And did you hear, Nikolai, that on the same day, uh, widow so-and-so and her sister were murdered and dropped? I never knew a thing about it. The first thing I heard of it was from Avanasai Pavlovich the day before yesterday. And where did you find the earrings? I found them on a payment. Why didn't you go to work with Dimitri the other day? Because I was drinking. And where were you drinking? Oh, in such and such a place. Where? Why did you run away from Dushkins? Oh, because, uh, because I was awfully frightened. What were you frightened of? That I should be accused. How could you be frightened if you felt free from guilt? Now, Zasmav, you may not believe me. That question was lit put literally in those words. I know if, uh, it for a fact. It was repeated to me exactly. What do you say to that? Well, anyway, there's the evidence. I'm not talking about the evidence now. I'm talking about the, that question of their own idea and themselves. Well, so they squeeze and squeeze him and he confessed. I did not find it on the street. Find it in the street. Um... But in the flat where I was painting with Dimitri, and how was that? Why, Dimitri and I were painting there all day, and we were just getting ready to go, and Dimitri took a brush and painted my face, and he ran off, and I after him. I ran after him, shattered my hardest, and at the bottom of the stairs, I ran right against the porter and some gentlemen, and how many gentlemen were there, I don't remember. And the porter swore at me, and the other porter swore too, and the porter's wife came out and swore at us too, and a gentleman came into the entry with a lady, and he swore at us too. For Dimitri and I lay right across the way. I got hold of Dimitri's hair and knocked him down and began beating him. And Dimitri too caught me by the hair and began beating me. But we did not... Um, but we, but we did it uh, all not for temper, but in a friendly way for sport. And then Dimitri escaped and ran into the street, and I, and I ran after him, but I did not catch him and went back, into the flat, went back to the flat alone. I had to clear up my things. I began putting them together, expecting Dimitri to come, and there in the passage in the corner by the door, I stepped on the, stepped on the box. I saw it lying there, wrapped up in paper. I took off the paper, saw some little hooks, undid them, and in the box were the earrings. Behind the door? Lying behind the door? Behind the door? Raskolnikov cried suddenly with the same blank look of terror at Razumihin and he slowly sat up on the sofa, leaning on his hand. Yes, why? What's the matter? What's wrong? Razumihin too got up from his seat. Nothing, Raskolnikov answered faintly, turning to the wall, all were silent for a while. He must have waked from a dream, Razumihin said at last, looking queringly at Zasimov. The latter slightly shook his head. Well, go on, said Zasimov. What's next? What next? What next? As soon as he saw the earrings, forgetting Dimitri and everything, he took up his cap and ran to Dushkin and, as we know, got a ruble from him. He told a lie, saying he found him uh, in the street and went up drinking. He keeps repeating his old story about the murder. I know nothing of it, never heard of it till the day before yesterday. And why didn't you come to the police till now? I was frightened. And why did you try to hang yourself from anxiety? What anxiety? That I, I should be accused of it. 
well that's the whole story and uh, now what do you suppose they deduce from that well there's no supposing it's a clue such as it is a fact you wouldn't have your painter set free now they're simply taking him for the murder uh, they haven't uh, a shadow of doubt that's nonsense you're excited but what about the earrings you must admit that if on the very same day and hour earrings from the old woman's box have come into Nicolas' hands they must have come there somehow that's a good deal there's a that's a good deal in such a case how did they get there? How did they get there? Uh, cried Rosamahan. How can you, a doctor whose duty it is to study man, study man, and who has more opportunity than anything else for studying human nature, how can you fail to see the character of the man and the whole story? Don't you see at once that the answers he has given in the examination are the holy truth? They came into his hand precisely as he told us. He stepped down the box and picked it up. The holy truth? But he didn't, didn't he own himself that he told a lie at first? Listen to me. Listen attentively. The porter and coach and person per- Pestrikov and the other porter and the wife of the first porter and the man who was sitting in the porter's lodge and the man, Krikov, who had just gotten out of cab at that minute and went in the entry, went in at the entry with the lady on his arm. That is, eight or ten witnesses agreed that Nikolai had Dimitri on the ground, was lying on him, beating him, while Dimitri hung onto his hair, beating him too. They, lie, they lay right across the way, blocking, blocking the thoroughfare. They were sworn at on all sides while they were, they like children, the very words of the witnesses were falling over one another, squealing, fighting and laughing with the funniest faces and chasing one another like children. They ran, ran into the street. Now, take careful note. The bodies upstairs were warm, you understand? Warm when they found them. If they or Nikolai alone had murdered them and broken open the boxes or simply taken part in the robbery, allow me to ask you one question. Do their state of mind, the squeals and giggles on child is coughing at the gate fit and with axes, bloodshed, fiendish cunning, robbery? They had just killed him, not five, ten minutes before, uh, for the bodies were still warm and at once leaving the flat open, not knowing that people would go there at once. Flinging away their booty, they rolled about like children, laughing and attracting general attention. And there are, there are a dozen witnesses to swear to that. Of course, it is strange. It's impossible indeed, but... No, brother, no buts. And if the earrings being found in Nikolai's hands at the very day and hour of the murder constitutes an important piece of circumstantial evidence against him, although the explanation given by him accounts for it and therefore it does not tell seriously against him, one must take into consideration the facts which prove him innocent, especially as they are facts that cannot be denied. And how do you suppose from the character of our legal system that they will accept, or that they are in a position to accept, this fact, resting simply on a psychological impossibility, as irrefutable and un- 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 conclusively breaking down the circumstantial evidence for the pr- prosecution? No, they won't accept it. They certainly won't, because they found the jail case and the man tried to hang himself, which he could not have done if he had, hadn't felt guilty. That's the point. That's what excites me, you must understand. Oh, I see you're, you're excited. Wait a bit. I forgot to ask you, wh- what proof is there that the box came from the old woman? That's been proved, said Rosamahan with apparent reluctance, frowning. Koch recognized the jail case and gave the name of the owner, which uh, who proved conclusi- conclusively that it was his. That's bad. Now another point. Did anyone see Nikolai at the time that Koch and Pestreko were going upstairs at first? And is there and is there no evidence about that? Nobody did see him. Razumihin answered with vexation. That's the worst of it. Even Koch and Pestreko did not notice them on their way upstairs. Though indeed their evidence could not have been worth much. They said uh, they saw the flat was open and that there must have then there must be work going on it, but they took no special notice and could not remember whether there actually were men at work in it. Hmm. So the only evidence for the defense is that they were beating one another and laughing. That constitutes a strong presumption, but how do you explain the facts yourself? How do I explain them? What is there to explain? It's clear. At any rate, the direction in which uh, explanation is to be sought is clear, and the jewel case points to it. The real murderer dropped those earrings. The murderer was upstairs, locked in, when Koch and Pestryakov knocked at the door. Koch, like an, like an ass, did not stay at the door, so the murderer popped out and ran down too, for he had no other way of escape. He hid from Koch, Pestryakov, and the porter, porter in the flat when Nikolai and Dimitri had just run out of it. He stopped there while the porter and others were going upstairs, waited till they were out of hearing, and then uh, went calmly downstairs at the very minute when Dimitri and Nikolai ran out onto the street, and there was no one in the entry. Possibly he, he was seen, but not noticed. There were lots of people going in and out. Uh, he must have dropped the earrings out of his pocket when he stood behind the door and did not notice he dropped them because he had other things to think of. The jail case is a conclusive proof that he did stand there. That's how I explain it. Too clever. No, my boy, you're too clever. That beats everything. But why? 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 Because everything fits so well. It's too melodramatic. Ach, Razumahin was exclaiming, but at that moment, the door opened and a person Ach came in who was a stranger to all present. We will pick it, pick this up. 
in the next video or I might read this without recording. Bye-bye.